Uh, first, I'd like to thank Oracle for hosting uh, he us here today and the Silicon Valley Leadership Group for convening this summit. Uh, Dr. Francis, let's jump right in. Okay, let's go. There is no one, no one size fits all solution for either companies or consumers when it comes to accelerating Zev adoption. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about Ibi Noir's approach to increasing Zev adoption, specifically when it comes to black and Latino communities? Absolutely. So let me start off first by describing who we are and what we do. So usually before I start these conversations, I do like to know how many EV drivers, current EV drivers there are in the room. And because this is California, it's gonna look a lot different from other places in the country where both <laughs> Seth and I uh, speak. Okay, fa fabulous, thank you. So EV Noir, we're a consultancy. We work on electric connected shared and autonomous mobility solutions. Within that space, we, or I lead, along with some of our co-managing uh, partners, we lead a team of engineers, data and research scientists, charging infrastructure specialists, policy uh, consultants, as well as e-mobility uh, consultants. And so we work with auto manufacturers, charging infrastructure companies, ride share and delivery network companies. We've been working with the 25 largest cities along with smaller cities and smaller under 150,000. We're also working with nonprofits, academia, and the list could go on. But essentially, we're working collectively with these communities and partners to decarbonize their fleets. So we're working with them to create strategy as well as implement the strategy to decarbonize fleets, but also do it in a way that's reflective of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So that's one piece of the work that we lead in this space. The second phase where we would target more specifically diverse communities and those communities that are underrepresented in the clean transportation conversation is with our nonprofit, which is EV Hybrid Noir. So EV Hybrid Noir is the nation's largest network of diverse EV drivers and enthusiasts. And so we have thousands of members across the country, as well as in Europe, Canada, Asia, <laughs> Africa, and the Caribbean. And our membership skews primarily black and Hispanic. And we have memberships in, within the United States across most major markets. And within our organization, the focus or mission is to equitably accelerate EV awareness as well as multimodal clean transportation adoption. So that's everything from scooters and e-bikes up to medium heavy duty freight electrification. So our members are trained to do advocacy. So whether it's going to their local leadership, the state house, or testifying between EPA on clean uh, vehicle standard hearings. They're trained to do advocacy. They also do outreach and engagement, targeting their communities. So it's really important to have spokespersons that are reflective of those communities talking about EV adoption and normalizing the behavior. Because one of the things that we've seen in our research is that when you ask people, particularly um, black and Hispanic community members and individuals, what an EV driver looks like, they don't say it looks like myself and Seth. And myself, I've been driving an electric vehicle for the last six or so years, and my first electric vehicle was less than $10,000. And so when they hear that narrative from myself or others that look like them and are reflective of their communities and can really talk about what was the impetus for them to make that transition from an ICE vehicle, it really resonates and it's, it's very impactful. And so for us, we want to normalize EV adoption. We want to make sure that consumer education and outreach and engagement is reflective of those communities. And then we also want to continue to make sure that we're advocating for building out EV charging infrastructure in a way that's equitable and accessible, not just for black and brown communities, but also for rural communities, tribal and indigenous communities, and those for uh, individuals that have specific needs around ADA. So we want to make sure that our accelerating our transition is really truly accessible to all communities. That's great, and that brings me to my next question actually. Mm -hmm. California recently achieved its goal of putting one and a half million zero emission vehicles on the road two years early. Mm -hmm. uh, from your point of, uh, point of view, what contributed to this early su success? And what should others who are looking to re replicate this success be thinking? Also, where's California falling short? <laughs> okay. So let me go into my files on this one. But no, um, specifically, these are some of the ways that you know, California has been successful. So creating a policy um, culture or a policy environment that's supportive to Zevs. So one of the things that obviously California has done well, and, and I'm sure many of you are from right here in California, is that 
California has issued the ZEB mandates, which requires manufacturers to produce and sell a certain number of ZEBs in California. There's also been different financial incentives and rebates as well as tax credits to really accelerate EV adoption. And so one of the things that we know is successful and effective in accelerating EV adoption in more progressive countries and markets, when you look at a Norway, that's some of the things and the strategies that they've implemented. So that's one thing. Another thing that has uh, California is doing well or has done to help reach this number and this goal or really exceed it, is that building out charging infrastructure. So being intentional in terms of addressing charging infrastructure gaps and needs is gonna be one of the ways that you're gonna accelerate EV adoption, not just with the early adopter crowd, but with mass markets and diverse communities. Also, another strategy is around consumer education and outreach, so making sure that all communities have access to information about electric vehicles and it's in a manner that's culturally appropriate. So is it in the language that this community speaks in? Are there people that look like members in this community? Uh, are there people who are driving those vehicles in this community being part of those spokespeople that can talk about the experience? Also, public-private partnerships are really important. So making sure like you're engaging with different stakeholder groups to really leverage resources and leverage best practice and leverage strategies that are gonna work well. And so I could go on and on. <laughs> <laughs> but those are some of the strategies that have, been, have initially worked really well. I think moving forward, some of the ways that we uh, we here in California and others outside of California, because I don't, I don't live in California, but what others c can take away from the California model is some of those points that I've addressed, but also looking at um, innovation around research and development and charging infrastructure, obviously battery technology, some very difficult concepts to crack or nuts to crack include charging infrastructure. So while we are accelerating charging infrastructure, uh, both with private sector investment and public sector investment with the recent uh, policies from the federal government, there's still a lot of gaps. And so in order to accelerate EV adoption, we've gotta be able to figure out the multifamily um, you know, charging infrastructure needs, but really making sure that we have charging infrastructure from a residential workplace and community standpoint is, is some of the ways that we're gonna be able to move this conversation forward. Absolutely. What do you think about uh, companies and public policymakers uh, building on this momentum to meet the governor's goal of 100% light duty uh, zero emission vehicle sales by 2035? How, how do you think that road is, there's a clear path for us to achieve that? So, you know, there are different examples. And so, but it takes people like those folks here in the room, as well as folks that we're hoping to train and encourage them to come into the mobility sector to be able to address some of those issues. So one of the things that actually we've done in our work is that, you know, looking across the room, uh, you know, thank you all for coming to this space, but there still needs to be more diverse people. So we need more black or African-American, Hispanic thought leaders, native and tribal indigenous leaders, folks who come from rural communities, other communities have, who have been underrepresented in this conversation around clean energy and clean transportation, because they can bring their lived experiences to those conversations and so that they can inform some of the challenges and some of the gaps that we see in the space by sharing that diverse perspective that isn't always represented in the room where these policy decisions are being made or pilots are being discussed. So I think it's really critical that in order to, yes, meet that 2035 goal and the objectives is that if we're intentional about bringing all facets of the clean transportation community and the end user into the conversation, I think we'll, we'll see a lot of progress and we'll even come up with some more innovative uh, strategies that will help us reach those goals potentially even earlier than we intend. That's uh, very optimistic and I appreciate <laughs> that. And I'd I, like to see the glass <laughs> half full. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. I wonder if, uh, if uh, that perspective uh, comes out of your, your previous uh, career in medicine. Uh, you brought your years of experience in health to the EV policy mm -hmm. world. Um, how does your past uh, in the medical field influence your passion for transportation, decarbonization, and equity? Sure, absolutely. So for those in the room who are not aware, so my I come from this conversation, used to be a medical professor and researcher looking at social determinants of health and health disparities. And so the social de determinants of health framework is simply a framework that looks at 
where people live, work, well, where they're born, they live, work, and, and, and age, and understanding how those different facets, so it's access to clean transport, access to transportation broadly. Always, I'm always thinking clean transportation, but it's access to transportation, access to a medical home, it's you know having access to uh, fresh fruits and vegetables, a clean environment. So how are all those things intersecting with your health and well-being? And then at the same time, like I'm looking at this, these issues from a health disparities lens. So why are certain communities disproportionately impacted by certain phenomena? So like transportation emissions and pollution. Well, you can very clearly see that there have been transportation policies. There's a legacy of inequality. When you go back and look at 1896 and the Plessy versus Ferguson landmark that said separate, equal, separate but equal in transportation, and how over the last hundred plus years that has been uh, integrated into social policy, housing covenants, you have residential segregation and you know housing um, discrimination, issues with loans and car loans, home loans, et cetera. So it's all kind of inter intersecting. So for us and for me, as I think about this from like that public health, health medical lens, I can't think about transportation and mobility without thinking about the intersection between race and place. And so when you look at data, the number one reason or the number one way to um, understand somebody's health and well-being is looking at their zip code. 70% of black people live in communities that are disproportionately impacted by um, air pollution. So I'm thinking about all of those types of data points and how it integrates with transportation and equity. And so that's the lens that I bring to this conversation into this space. That's wonderful to hear. Uh, Uber is also committed to an equitable transition to zero emission vehicles for drivers on our platform. Uh, we've committed uh, $800 million to our Green Future program and incentivized uh, drivers to purchase EVs. Um, what challenges do you, from your perspective, do rideshare drivers continue to face in, ex in accessing uh, EVs? Yeah. Um, so rideshare drivers are a really unique and special community, but I think let's talk about first, give the audience a better understanding of what the green fund, what the incentive and rebate program is for yeah. the Uber transition. Absolutely. So then Sorry. I can take a dive into the, the research results. Yes, yeah, so the $800 million we've committed uh, is being spent in several different ways. Um, uh, some of it is uh, updated features in the app, um, many of which have been announced uh, just this morning uh, with our Go Get Zero event uh, out of London. Um, this includes uh, a, uh, features in the driver side app that allow drivers to make uh, cost comparisons between uh, internal combustion engine vehicles and zero emission, uh, zero emission vehicles uh, when considering a new purchase uh, or lease. Um, it also includes uh, map features for drivers to not only direct them to charging infrastructure, but uh, help them plan their, their day around uh, charging, um, along with uh, uh, information on pricing and such. Um, we've also uh, partnered with Hertz and Tesla uh, for Hertz to, part to purchase 50,000 Teslas uh, for use in the US and Canada by Uber drivers uh, or for the purpose of, of Uber drivers. Um, and this is a very popular program among drivers. Um, and we see this being a very equitable program, uh, not intentionally, uh, as it were, but accidentally, uh, because not all drivers uh, on, the, on the rideshare platform have the same capability uh, to purchase uh, a zero emission vehicle, not only from the potential cost of a down payment, but also just the qualification for financing. Uh, and so the, the ability to uh, have a rental entry uh, entry level vehicle program um, helps them uh, earn enough, uh, earn more than they would be on a, in an internal combustion engine and ideally uh, save over time and transition to a lease to own or purchase uh, of, a, of a full uh, vehicle on their own. Um, so that's just a, a few of the uh, um, announcements that were made today uh, uh, regarding our uh, green program. Um, we also have a few on the sustainability side with regard to delivery. Uh, as well, but we'll stick with rides for now. So you all got to hear like a secret, uh, a release first for uh, this conversation. <laughs> the, 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 the announcements were made this morning in, in London, uh, but they, uh, yes, the announcements were made this London in, this morning in London, so we're just a few hours behind, but they are public now. Yes. Yeah. So, so now I'll talk a little bit more about the research in terms from the rideshare driver perspective. So one of the things that we noticed um, early on in the conversation is that there's a very different, uh, there's some gaps around the driver, what the drivers think being an EV owner or a driver is on the rideshare platform versus what it's really like. 
And so the way we've been working with Uber, we started working with you all before the announcement came out um, back in 2020. But since that time, we've been engaging with the rideshare community as well as other key stakeholders who um, are part of this clean transportation lexicon. And the idea is that in order to help accelerate this transition, we need to understand the end user's perspective and experience so that we can help them utilize the different rebates and incentives that you all are offering. So um, one of the things that we looked at are just some of the themes that we looked at were their driving habits, you know, what's the best way to engage with them in terms of marketing, communications, and outreach. We also wanted to understand their knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs about clean transportation and electric vehicles, understand barriers to adoption, and what are the specific needs that they have around accelerating their transition. And here's what we learned. So in terms of EV drivers specifically, the things that they really enjoyed about being an EV driver on the rideshare platform was that they mentioned the cost savings. That was a big piece of it. They also mentioned like not having to think about maintenance. I can understand that because I'm sure all of you who are EV drivers know that the, your maintenance consists of tires every few years. And for some of those of you who may be driving it, who like to drive fast, you may go through tires a little bit quicker, but it's a windshield wipers and windshield wiper fluid. So that's what we have in terms of maintenance. <laughs> the drivers also mentioned uh, cool technology, just so, you know, having this vehicle is like having like a spaceship. Now, in terms of the ICE vehicle or the internal combustion vehicle owners, they shared uncertainty about EV adoption and use. They shared feedback about concerns around range, vehicle costs and access, uh, limited charging infrastructure, particularly we heard that among folks who live in uh, residential properties and uh, apartments. And then let's see, overall what we did here was that there's a perception of higher upfront costs to make that transition. There's perceived lack of charging infrastructure. There's, they all, there's also that thought that the vehicles aren't big enough uh, they're not going to be able to fit their passengers and their luggage, et cetera. And again, the, you know, the charging infrastructure concerns. But I want to end or leave you with a couple things on what they want. So what they want is they want improved communication about EVs. They want opportunities to touch, feel, and experience the, the technology. They also want to be communicated uh, via the app and emails in terms of finding out more information. They want opportunities to test drive the vehicles as well as uh, participate in rental programs, which of course you guys are offering. Um, we actually just facilitated a uh, ride and drive kind of driver engagement event in Boston last week with the Uber team. And I mean, there were, there were hundreds of drivers there and about a quarter of those drivers signed up right after the event with the Hertz team that was on site for their rental program. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of opportunities, but again, we have to bring the technology to the community, to the consumer group that we're targeting to be able to address all of their questions, or at least maybe not all, but the majority of their questions in, in one setting. Let's um, expand on one piece of that to, to finish our conversation mm -hmm. here. Um, I think it's something that's gonna get brought up a little bit later today as well at the summit. Um, what do you think needs to be done to encourage landlords uh, and homeowner, homeowners groups to put uh, to install charging infrastructure okay. for multifamily uh, dwellings and apartment complexes and things yes. like that. So one, consumer education. Um, the other piece is partnering with both private and public and private stakeholders, so partnering with utilities and cooperatives so that we can um, provide incentives and rebates to defray the cost of installing charging infrastructure, um, working with develop developers on the front end to, um, to um, you know, provide charging infrastructure. I think taking a step back from the developer conversation is working with cities. So we've had the opportunity, as I mentioned, um, prior to working with the 25 largest cities as well as the small, smaller cities, some of the work that we've done has been around building code, or code ordinances. So working with cities um, and communities to put those things in place. And also, obviously, there's a lot of NEVI funding coming around, but initially it's you know corridor charging, then community charging, and then we hope we will be able to get some additional rebates and support. But we have a national conference that talks about all of those issues, so I would encourage you all to check out our national e-mobility diversity, equity, and inclusion conference, um, and that's at e-mobility, uh, e-mobilitydniconference.com. Wonderful, Dr. Francis. It's so lovely to see you again, and I very much appreciated our conversation too. today. Thank you all for listening. We appreciate your time. Thank you all. Have a great rest of the conference. <laughs>